All right, so welcome everybody to UPAA Live. Uh, I'm Glenn Carpenter. Uh, I am the uh, fearful leader of this group and uh, glad to see everybody. Um, these are great times to um, reconnect with our group and uh, find out what everyone's doing. Uh, so you'll find out from uh, our, our topic that this project really started quite a while ago. And uh, so this group has been thinking about this for a little over a year, uh, trying to come up with um, a position paper. So as right after we published the paper, uh, we had hoped to get a bigger audience to see what uh, the committee had done and what our members are doing. And one group that reached out to us was the National Council for Marketing and Public Relations which is a mouthful, but they are the two-year college uh, marketing and PR group that uh, reached out and said, we'd love for you guys to do a presentation uh, at our national conference in March. So the team got together and was terrified that we had to videotape ourselves um, explaining what we had done, because uh, that's how this conference will be. Uh, and then we said, okay, well, we've done this. And uh, now we need to uh, present it also to our group. So the format for this will be a little bit different. Uh, we're going to play the video that the team put together, um, each of us saying a little bit about it. And then at the end, uh, we'll have more of a discussion amongst the people that are here at this meeting. Uh, but during the, um, the video, if uh, something comes up, go ahead and type a question into the chat. Um, we may or may not answer it right away. We may hold it to the end if it's something we need to address to everybody. Um, but sit back, have lunch, you know, have a nice sandwich from your local deli or leftovers from last night and watch uh, as we all are terrified to be in front of the camera. Um, also, before we uh, start, Nate, um, the members who were on the, the committee um, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself so people know who uh, was a part of this. Sydney? I'm waiting on Amanda. Um, oh, okay. I'm Sydney Scott. I work at Boston University and I helped write that paper. Take it away, Amanda. I'm Amanda Pitts. I work at Green Valley State University. Um, and I also helped write the paper. I did more of the helping with research than writing, but that's me. Matt, you didn't help write the paper, but this is really your, you started this thing as you'll find out. So. Uh, yes, yeah, I'm Matt Kishore from Notre Dame. Um, uh, this all began with a phone call between me and Glenn and I sat in on a few of the committee meetings, but did, almost nothing that committee is, you know, the, the, the heavy lifting was not done by me one bit, but uh, I kind of started this ball rolling downhill. And the, I don't think I see Su Susan here yet. She may be jumping on later. I think she had a busy morning, uh, but uh, Susan McSpadden was the chief author of the paper and uh, she uh, really did a fantastic job with it. As you guys know, you've read it. Um, but she should be joining us. Uh, and there were others who chimed in on different things. Um, so why don't we go ahead and uh, get the, there we go. Welcome to Equity and Inclusion in Higher Education Photography. I'm Glenn Carpenter. I'm the photographer at Moraine Valley Community College. And I am also the president of UPAA the University Photographers Association of America. UPAA has about 350 members from across the globe who every day try to accurately portray their university or college in photography. Anchorage 
and Susan McSpadden from Johnson County Community College. Susan was the chief author of our paper. And speaking of the paper, it's available at upaa.org. So Matt, why don't you go ahead and get us started this morning? Hi, I'm Matt Kishore. I'm the senior university photographer at the University of Notre Dame. I'm not only a Notre Dame employee, I'm a Notre Dame alum. I graduated in 1994. So as a student, I was here from 1990 to 94, and I worked in the yearbook. And we had questions of diversity and representing diversity arise even then, only we were still at that point, barely 20 years removed from having gone co-ed. Notre Dame was not the most diverse place. And, and when we tried to show diversity, it definitely felt staged and contrived. Um, and fast forward 30 years, and it's genuinely a much more diverse place. And that's wonderful. But from time to time, I still might get called out on social media for photos where someone thought I didn't show enough diversity, or we might get questions of someone wanting to know, did we stage or engineer diversity through post-processing? And the answer is definitely no, never. Um, but I've wrestled with the question from time to time in my own mind of, am I doing this the best it can be done? I definitely want to help the university attract even more diversity. And so I want to know that I'm doing this right. And these are questions that I would think about in my own from time to time. Uh, UPA is such a wonderful organization in that they encourage ideas and contributions from everyone, not just board members. Uh, and over the years, UPA at our annual symposium has begun doing outreach and service programs. And, and we've been thinking in a larger external way uh, with some of the service programs that we've done. And I thought, this is the sort of thing that UPA was created to think about questions of diversity and how we show them as university photographers, because we're staff photographers. We have long institutional memories. We think about these kinds of questions more so than a freelancer or occasional campus visitor might. And so I raised this question with Glenn Carpenter, the UPAA president in the fall of 2019. And I thought in the spirit of some of the outreach activities we were doing at the symposium, perhaps for the 2020 symposium, we could produce a statement on diversity and inclusion. Not a policy because everyone's campus is different, but a statement that people could take back to their leadership on their various campuses and say to their leadership and say to higher ed as a whole, we at UPAA think about these things, we endorse this statement, and we just want to let the world know that we do more than just stand around and ask each other what our favorite f-stop is at our symposium, and, and we think about bigger things than technical things. Glenn was completely in support of that idea, no surprise, and assembled the committee that later produced the paper. And the first meeting of the committee was in March 2020, on the day that, that I really feel like the national panic over COVID set in. And there would have been every excuse in the world to table this until the crisis had passed. And they didn't. And I am so proud and grateful to the committee for what they produced. And I am proud and grateful to have played a small part in having produced it. Thank you. Matt's idea was brought to the board and we formed a committee in February of 2020. I was a new member of the board and was excited that there was a call from our president for this to turn into something that as an organization we could stand by I knew members of UPAA would be just as excited as me for us to take this on. There were challenges, of course. Um, we formed, like I said, in February 2020, just before COVID really um, struck the United States. Like everyone, our lives had new schedules, new routines, and greater responsibilities. Our organization meets once a year at a summer symposium. Before everything hit, I was personally excited to, of course, meet with the board, but meet with other members of the committee, and most importantly, to meet with members of UPAA and listen to the unique challenges that they have at their university. We also formed at a time right before racial injustices were at the top of the national debate. 
violence against people of color was not a new issue, but in many cases, instances of racial injustice, um, often those involving law enforcement were brought to light mainly because people had a camera in their pocket. For me personally, this reminded me what an important role I play and what an important role my camera plays in shaping perceptions and to shine light. I never thought that working at a small university, I was creating great change or making a giant difference, but it reminded me that with my camera, I can shine a light on those who are underrepresented and those who feel like they are either marginalized or don't fit in. It reminded me of the role that I play, again, not just me and my camera, but the role that photographers, videographers, social media managers, and designers all have a role and all have an, their hands on, their fingerprints on, shaping a perception of our institutions. I think the whole committee knew that we hoped that this paper would help all of the members of UPAA and hopefully to share it beyond that, uh, to tell, help tell stories in a more compassionate manner. To get the actual paper started, we started with research and Amanda can tell you more about that. Thanks, Trevor. Hi all, I'm Amanda Pitts, senior photographer at Grand Valley State University. GVSU is located in Southwest Michigan between the city of Grand Rapids and the Lakeshore. To get started on this paper, we did a bit of research to see what kind of related work was out there that focused on inclusivity and diversity in higher ed photography. Several of us reached out to the librarians at our own colleges and universities to help us search out anything we could use to get started. We also asked our diversity, equity, and inclusion professionals if they had any research recommendations in this area. Surprise, there were very, very few resources out there that were specifically about this. We gleaned what information we could from the resources available, but most things we found were outdated or about more general overall marketing in higher ed, and most of the resources were not particularly useful. So how did we write this paper then? We decided to turn to the DEI experts that we work with at our schools. We wondered, what do they notice about university photography and what are their views on how we can best improve our photography in the area of DEI? First, the committee brainstormed a bunch of questions, the answers to which we thought might provide useful information to form the basis of the paper. We then narrowed the questions down to five, which you can see here in this slide. Then those five questions were sent on to the DEI professionals at several universities. As the answers flowed in, we added them to a spreadsheet where we could look across all of the responses and spot similarities and differences. After we received a good number of responses, Sydney Scott from Boston University formed an outline based on the responses. There were many commonalities between the answers. Using the answers from experts, our own personal experiences as university photographers, and the resources we had found about marketing in higher education, we were able to come up with an outline that we felt covered most of the important points that should be made about inclusion and diversity in higher ed photography. The outline was broken up into categories or sections like authenticity is paramount. Then we added the supporting quotes from our experts into those sections where they best fit. We reviewed and edited the outline through Google Docs, each committee member adding comments and suggestions. Once we were satisfied with the outline, we sent it back to our DEI experts to get their feedback. We received very positive and constructive responses and were able to work some of them into the revised outline and then into the final paper. Jen Sue Bishop, director of the Milton E. Ford LGBT Resource Center at Grand Valley State University had this to say about the finished paper. Best practices for inclusive and diverse photography in higher education is a thoughtful and critically important resource for universities and colleges. As we continue to both imagine the possibilities and reflect the realities of our diverse campus, photography is an important tool we can leverage to live into our commitment of creating educational access. 
it is a reminder that diversity, equity, and inclusion is all of our work. Now, to speak a bit more about representation in university photography is Jen Bowes, Chief Diversity Officer, University of Alaska, Anchorage. Representation matters. When prospective students, even as young as elementary school age, see university billboards and websites that contain images that represent their ethnicity, nationality, gender, religion, ability, or any other aspect of their identity, they believe that they too can achieve the dream. Inclusive images can provide hope to students from underrepresented backgrounds that they can rise above the inequities and injustices they may experience in their lives. These images may often be the first societal representations students receive about what college means and who college is for. Although the photographs should always be authentic, even aspirational representation opens up a world of possibility that many may have thought was closed to them. Hello, I'm Susan McSpadden, marketing photographer for Johnson County Community College in the Kansas City area. Based on the information we received from the DEI professionals, we were able to break it into categories. These categories include authenticity, going beyond skin color, being representative without overselling, and using images in a timely and contextual way. Authenticity in photography means being truthful in representing the campus community in all areas. This builds trust in the messaging that institutions communicate to current and prospective students. Trust in your authenticity leads to more of a willingness to work with photographers and marketing departments. Photographers need to be able to capture diversity where it really is, rather than engineering diversity into an image. Our audience is savvy and can spot a produced image that is trying to force diverse narratives. Also, trying to achieve a false representation of diversity through software editing, such as darkening a skin tone or dropping a person of color into a scene, is not worth the hit to an institution's credibility. The next category of the paper is about going beyond skin color, which includes quite a few subcategories, including stereotyping, misidentification, representing staff and faculty, and services and spaces. I'm fortunate to work on a pretty racially diverse campus with a 35% non-white student population. So capturing representative races is the easy part. Other aspects of diversity are more challenging to capture because they can't readily be seen. Examples are sexual orientation, gender identity, mental and some physical disabilities, and religion. To be inclusive in these areas, photographers need to seek out visual cues that they can use in their images, such as symbols and signage. A student wearing a cross or carrying a rosary, clothing with representative messaging and and pins and stickers and patches on backpacks, water bottles and laptops can help visually broaden DEI beyond skin color. Stereotyping is probably the biggest offense in marketing photography. We've all seen examples of black students only shown as athletes and Asian students only shown as studious. Showing those who are underrepresented in broader roles demonstrates that the full potential of all students is recognized by your institution. Regarding misidentification, marketing departments often rely on keywords within the metadata of image files to help find and choose photos for publication. The accuracy of the keyword descriptors is central to correctly reflecting diversity and showing knowledge and sensitivity to ethnic and racial differences. When choosing keywords for a photograph of a group of brown students of uncertain ethnicity, for example, it's best to use the umbrella terms diverse and diversity as descriptors rather than misidentifying a Honduran student as a Mexican. We can broaden our DEI efforts beyond students by incorporating a diverse workforce in our publications. Prospective students often look to faculty and staff as models of their future. Highlighting diverse faculty and staff who are achieving in their field illustrates the opportunities available to students as well as showing that inclusion and diversity are valued beyond the classroom. The final subcategory in this section is about services and spaces. 
signs for gender neutral bathrooms and dedicated breastfeeding rooms, braille on building entrances, classrooms, and elevators, closed captioning on digital monitors, and sign language interpreters can all visually sig signify inclusion. Often photographers, myself included, try to avoid including those things to create a cleaner composition. Crystal Williams, the Associate Provost of Diversity and Inclusion at Boston University made a really good statement. She said, when there is a photograph of a leader making a speech and the ASL interpreter is either cropped out or more likely the photograph that omits the ASL interpreter is chosen for publication, we're making a decision not based on the quality of the photograph, but on the content of the photograph. In this way, we're not normalizing inclusive actions and those omissions have impact. Now I'm going to send it back to Trevor to talk about being representative without overselling. An issue I struggled with was how to show representation without giving a false image of our campuses. At the time of writing this paper, I was working at a small university in rural Ohio. A school such as, my, such as mine has unique challenges if printed materials are purely representational of the racial makeup of our campuses, it does not communicate where a school might want to be in the atmosphere and opportunities available to students, staff, and faculty of color. Done properly, it is not out of the question to show images in an aspirational context. If the school's goal is to attract more students of color, it's important to use images that communicate that those students have a place and can succeed on your campuses. When doing so, it must be done carefully. Images should be paired with census or other data so that prospective individuals can make informed decisions that are not based solely on visual imagery. We found a study that we cite in our paper that show most universities and colleges are using students of color in an over-representational manner in their marketing materials. If you're an institution that uses students of color in an aspirational context, it's important to remember that staff Prospective staff, students, and faculty have tools outside of your marketing materials to make decisions. If they don't already have a perception or knowledge of your campus, say they live out of town, for example, well, a simple visit or an incredibly simple social media search can show another aspect of your universities from another perspective. It can be damaging if they find that marketing materials are in excess over representing students, students of color. As Matt pointed out earlier, um, authenticity is very important. If minority populations are small, a concise effort must be made to not overuse, overuse imagery of those individuals. Sometimes it's not uncommon to grab a handful of students and take them all across campus to show different areas of campus life. Um, just as you would for any student, regardless of their race, it's very important to not show the same individuals, especially students of color, in every aspect of campus life. It might be unusual to have a student who is, for example, the same student in a chem lab, in a theater stage, on the, in an intramural league, in a fraternity. Um, showing that one individual, again, regardless of race, um, can certainly be detrimental when telling the visual story of our campuses. I now want to give it back to Amanda, who's going to discuss the final section of our paper, context and timeliness. Thank you, Trevor. Images used in context and in a timely manner signal ongoing attention to inclusion and diversity. 
Your community members, especially your students, notice when your college or university uses photos of the same underrepresented students or groups of people over and over again. This can signal to students and potential students a lack of diversity at the school or a lack of importance of diversity to the university. In addition, using photos of underrepresented students out of context can be insensitive and misleading. For example, you should not use a photo from an engineering event to represent the Department of Middle Eastern Studies because the students in the images are wearing hijabs. This creates a false narrative, will not go unnoticed by your students, and can indicate that the university is not invested in learning about and embracing the details surrounding inclusion and diversity. So what can you do about this? Number one, continually refresh and update your photography archive to include underrepresented students. Number two, only allow use of and access to the last few years of campus imagery. Number three, use photos and instruct others to use photos within the context that they were originally intended. Number four, properly keyword and or caption photos so that when they are found by someone other than yourself in an image search, the context of the image is obvious to the user. And number five, work with student organizations and clubs to identify a wide range of students to participate in photo shoots and also in order to capture imagery of authentic and timely student-centered events on campus. Now back to Glenn to wrap up our time with you before questions. Thanks, Amanda. You know, to get ready for this conference, this virtual conference, last night I had lemon chicken, green beans, and roasted potatoes. So today it was just like being at a conference. Eh, okay, sorry about that. Anyway, a couple things we wanted to leave you with. Proper uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion um, has a financial, a social, and a cultural value to it. Be authentic. Um, and use images exactly how they were intended to be used. Also, diversity, equity, and inclusion, that's everybody's responsibility. That goes from the graphic designer to the photographer, to the college president, to the director. It's all of our responsibility. Also, allow your staff time to develop relationships. Those relationships will lead to more authentic photos. That is the absolute key to this. I want to thank Amanda and Matt and Trevor and Jen and Susan uh, for their time today. And also thank you to the NCNPR board for allowing us to present. Thank you and have a great day. Oh, thank you for cutting the, uh, the music, Matt, or uh, Nate, that was that was, that was generous. Thank you so much. All right. Um, so yeah, let us know questions you have, comments, uh, things that we maybe need to address further. I think it's really great. Um, it was nice to kind of follow along with the document um, as well, kind of going back and forth <laughs> with what's being said and more information and detail within the document. Um, one kind of thing we're at our campus at Chico State is that we're going through a bit of um, rebranding efforts. Um, and one thing that we've talked is we tend to put diversity, equity, inclusion really in the forefront, um, kind of ignoring our, our core uh, lack of diversity structures. So what I mean by that is, you know, you can put a new coat of paint on a house, but if you don't change the furniture inside, people aren't gonna feel welcome. Um, so ensuring that whatever your efforts of diversity, it's just, it goes beyond just what you start now, but it's taking a look back at all the documents that you have on file, all the structures that you have internally, everything that is really outdated and needs to be addressed, um, from that to really, really change the mindset and behavior. Um, one of the big things that we've been doing with that is really working on our accessibility. Um, when we post things on the web, online, you know, having accessible captions is, you know, it changes how we work. Normally we just post it and not think about it, but now we have to post and think about, you know, what is, what does this image actually have? So we make the image itself accessible. So it's, it goes beyond just photographing, photographing diversity, but how we work 
in a different diverse uh, and equitable inclusive space as well. So it's not really a question, just more of a comment to think beyond, as, as it was stated, beyond the image itself, but more internally as well. Yeah, there was a, Jeff Miller threw a question up there about <clears throat> moving away from using diversity keywords. And I think um, we all see the value in not doing that. Is that what I'm hearing everybody say or thinking? We no longer put African-American or um, Hispanic-American, whatever it might be. Are we, is everyone moving away from that? At BU, we've never done that, um, or I can't say never, but in the 10 years that I've been there that we've, we have we haven't done that. And I don't think we use the word diversity either. Um, we shoot the images and quite honestly, in my mind, my thought is as the designer, if you need photos of someone in classroom, you shoot a, you, you search for classroom and then you use your eyes if you need somebody who doesn't look white or you need somebody who looks slightly different, um, somehow labeling it almost feels tokenizing in a, in a strange way. Um, I don't know, those are my thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I have a similar challenge. Uh, the word diversity, we, which we have used in our keywords, um, the question is, how do you define it? You know, we've even had tried to have these discussions with um, leadership in uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, at our university. And, and they have a hard time coming back to us and telling us how to define the word diversity. So, I mean, you know, if there's two people of color, is that diverse? If there's a person not of color and it's like, where is the definition if for, for a photograph? How do I define so I can accurately keyword a picture as diverse? It, it's just so hard to is one person uh, that of color diverse? How does it, you know, it's it's so hard for me to figure out. We have, yeah, do, um, are, you, are you guys even using, like she, she mentioned using diverse as a keyword. Is that, I, yes. I don't think we are using diverse as a keyword, but I'm intrigued by the ramifications of, of using that. I think um, there's, how do, how do you want to phrase this? or I see it as there's um, like it's a it's a function or at least what I'm hearing from and this is the business we're in um, my designers get called out on we need more diversity in this publication I mean who hasn't heard that right everybody's like this is not good it's not aspirational enough whatever it's not authentic enough so they want to be able to find that image. And from their standpoint, it's they just want to be able to search for something and find it. Um, so there's a, a functionality to it that um, is necessary. But in that functionality, does that have a judgment value, which is where I think Doug and some others were saying, is that an issue? Like we're, you know, you're saying I'm diverse, I'm really not diverse, or, you know, the lack of... I, I see the the pitfalls, and I wonder if we'll ever achieve. I mean, some as much as I hate to say it, I think we'll inadvertently offend somebody at some point, and it won't be intentional. It'll just be, you know, it's going to change. Five years from now, it's going to be something very different. And you know, I that's that's how I look at it. I don't know, any of the committee members want to weigh in on that? Maybe I'm misrepresenting it. I can weigh in a little bit if that's okay. Um, I just posted a, another URL in the chat for our online photo library user updates that we finally did and made public in October, uh, which drastically retooled some of the structure of our photo library. Um, just briefly, I won't read the whole thing, but we uh, very, very intentionally uh, retired the gallery that we had uh, called diversity as a theme and we uh, removed all references to the word diversity and any of our keywording and tagging um, we also have a note in there that searches for any captions that reference identified programs such as like the diversity forum the uw system diversity awards programs that have that word actually in the title will still yield results 
uh, but we actually worked with um, um, Carolyn Summers and uh, Libras to do a very deep uh, dig into our content that we had in the photo library and even retroactively remove the keyword tag from all of our assets. Um, and then we've also tightened up the shelf life of our photos quite a lot to five years um, in general for, for most people. What we've really found, and we were getting uh, a lot of criticism for uh, fairly, and, and I'll put this, you know, I think context is important. Our photo library has evolved numerous times over 10, 15 years. And there was a time when people were looking for pictures of diversity and we created those structures to try to aid that. Um, what we found in the end was in some ways it was an en enabling a furthering of tokenism of people when you tag <clears throat> certain groups of people as diverse, but don't tag other groups of people. It's like identifying someone as African-American, but not identifying someone as Hispanic or white. Um, why are you, you know, othering one group, but not another group? Um, and in some cases, uh, kind of going back to what S Sydney said about the classrooms of using your own eye is, you know, really people need to do some deeper work on this and ask those questions. Cause I used to play that game with people when they said, oh, we need a more diverse classroom shot. I would hit them three photos with Asian students. And they're like, no, that's not what I mean. And, you know, I would just be obnoxious kind of almost about pushing the topic. And what they were really looking for was an African-American student, but they weren't willing to state it. Um, I grew really tired of that. Um, the other thing is we talk about um, our youth being really savvy. Um, students on campus, didn't want, you know, they started to identify with university communications kind of negatively and didn't want to be anything part of our photo library. If you had mentioned that you work for university communications and they were aware of the photo library, well, I don't want anything to do with that. I don't want to be, you know, tokenized. Um, no, thank you. Um, so there are a lot of different issues there. Um, so we have removed all of those diversity tags and references. Um, we do try to add additional context to photos, um, but it's been a long learning process. Thanks, Jeff. Um, there was one quite, or uh, I think um, Kristen uh, Grace from uh, the museum down in Florida said biodiversity is something different. So diversity has a new meaning when you're at the Museum of Natural History, which very true. I hadn't consider that good point uh Kristen um thanks for bringing that up I, again you know, things we just don't think of um and then I, I Beth had a uh a, a question about tagging um Beth do you want to go ahead and just unmute and express your your thought or your question there sure no I was just curious because I happen to know from our group we have some of our um, very talented designers on this call I I'm curious like how often do you search that term I mean is that a common way for you to identify specific photos you're looking for that term diversity because we do use it and um, I, I just if they had thoughts I was hoping they would speak Anybody willing to admit to that? Hmm. Well, well, I, don't know. I was going to jump in. I work with Beth. I'm not actually one of the designers, but I do work with the designers. And on occasion, I am going through and looking for imagery for different brochures and um, pamphlets, et cetera, that we're putting out. And Beth, I, very honestly, I've never used that word. I didn't realize we were using that in our tagging. So it is something I could do. But I'm pretty much going on the basis that you were talking about. It's like just a visual, pulling up things, areas that I know it will be, and then looking for the diversity that I'm looking, whether it be um, race or it be sexual orientation or anything of that matter. So um, something I'll look into. I understand the concerns with it, though, from that standpoint. So. Hey, Beth, I'll chime in for you. Um, my name is Elissa. I'm one of the designers at, at Notre Dame um, and work with directly Amy and um, Beth as well. Uh, for 
for tagging that I mean I do I feel like hours can be spent on searching for any image um and so I will use diversity I'll use multicultural um and if I can even think of clubs, like I might even type in clubs just because I know we've got such a huge list of clubs that through there, I might see more diversity or events even. Um, and then, I mean, I even get down to whether I, you know, type in Asian or African American or, but just to see, but I find less when I get that, get into that than I do um, with multicultural and clubs and diversity and yeah unless that was in the club name we yeah we were not really using that but this is really helpful I think for us to know what's useful and if we were to stop doing that how would that impact the communicators jobs and the designers jobs if we were to just take that away would we be okay would people adjust I'm I would just I thought it was an interesting thing to discuss um, the other thing I do think I'm thinking as we're talking, what else I like, I know with athletic events, I I'm almost guaranteed to find a lot more range, um, in sporting events, um, the student section at, in, you know, for football. Um, so I would start getting into those things, um, where I know I could find some of that. So we had a, a really interesting just last week, um, so everyone, uh, don't, don't spread this around. This, this happened on my campus. Um, so I photographed an engineering class. Um, <clears throat> and our major class schedule came out and scrolling through the pages, checking photos. And there's an article on being awarded a Hispanic heritage school or something, or some distinction we received as um, so it's a, a big deal and they, and they used a photo from this engineering class of this student. And I looked at it and I'm, she has a mask on and I'm like, I don't know if she's, I don't know what, if would fit into a group. I, I, I can't confirm or I don't know who this is. So I feel um, without knowing this person, we can't use their image. And there was some pushback initially, like, you know, um, I'm like, we got to find out who she is, you know, and they find out if she's willing to be a part of this. And so then they're like, well, find us photos that would accompany this. And I think someone brought it up, search for clubs. We have an alliance of Latin American students. If the students are choosing to join the club, they're identifying in this group. It's not me identifying somebody as being in any group. It's a self-identification. Um, and in that case, I even tried to pick a photo where there was diversity in the in the photo of this club to show that you a you don't have to be a uh, Latin background um, to be a part of uh, this club. So there are real considerations that have impact what we do today when we think even when we think we're somewhat enlightened on the subject. So Glenn, I can't remember if when you and I sat on that UCDA panel. Um, and we were talking about photography. Um, I can't remember if I mentioned this, but it, it's more of a question than anything. You know, I don't know if we have any students in here, but I would love to know from student groups what, what they want to see because uh, we did a photo, we did a photo study one day where we just went around campus and we took, we took random pictures, anything and everything. Um, textures, you name it. And we call it, we actually called it a texture walk. And uh, I saw this group of girls talking and it just ended up being one of those, like one was with a bike and they were standing there and it was just a photo, you know, it was a perfect photo. And I asked them if I could take their photo and the one girl laughed at me and she's like, Oh, here you get to have your um, your perfect picture because there was a little bit of everything in that photo and she was mocking it. And so it just, it makes me question even more than like, what, what are they wanting to see? I think I may have quit that day and gone home. <laughs> that's, that's brutal. <laughs> I don't know. But I, um, I've, been I've been nervous about that starting to happen. 
Um, you know, if I, if I happen to photograph a student who is black or African-American and I've been concerned about them being like, well, why are you taking my picture? Um, I know that I consciously enter spaces when I shoot um, you know, a good example is a few weeks ago, I went to our student union and students can study in the student union and they're all distanced apart. And I walk into a space and there's one uh, black student within that space and I purposely don't photograph them because I'm not gonna tokenize that kid just because she happens to look different than everybody else. I'm gonna look for the student who is somehow interacting with somebody else or in a space that works compositionally that makes for an interesting photo. Um, I'm digressing a little bit from what you said, so I apologize, but um, I did notice, Douglas, your list of keywords that you saw on Getty, and I'm sort of thoughtful about it because Getty is worldwide. And I wonder if comparing tags from Getty, and I don't know if you're comparing, I'm not sure uh, the listing, the thought process of listing them, but I'm thoughtful about comparing Getty, which is worldwide, tagging to the marketing aspect of a university gallery bank photo, I'm not, photo bank. I'm not saying they're 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 right. I'm just saying that industry wants it. People mm -hmm. are consuming this. I understand um, all of the challenges involved in putting uh, the word diverse diversity to identify. Um, to me, as as I said, defining it. If I can't define it, how can I use the word to keyword something? Mm -hmm. If I can't define it, and if literally of our diversity and inclusion people are not willing to define it, how can I use it as a mm -hmm. keyword? And we honestly, we do use it, but it's this conversation is, you know, making me uh, bringing me to the place to recommend possibly not mm -hmm. doing it. Uh, if you can't, if you can't define it, how could you, you know, how can you rightfully use it? Yeah. Adding to the, to the Getty conversation. You know, thinking that Getty is a world, you know, worldwide organization, what does diverse even mean then? Because I know I've had conversations with, uh, you know, Dave Campbell at uh, Alabama State University before uh, when he gets someone that says, we need a diverse picture, it means a white student. Um, it becomes relative to your circumstance as well. So if you look at and, and you know, refer to Getty as a worldwide organization. Then, what does diverse really even mean for um, you know an African audience? Does that mean you know Caucasian individuals, European individuals? Um, does it mean you know all kinds of different international uh, perspectives? Um, it gets really diluted really fast, um, and that was one of the things that we really started to wrestle with was the the term tagging something diverse is first the first action as as Doug just mentioned is if I can't define it you know what business do I even do have putting that tag associated with the picture um, but if someone else is looking for the picture of diverse but is relying on my tagging of it Am I sort of enabling that other person not to broaden their experience and, and do some work as well? Not to mention that we've removed the word minority from, you know, for years, but just to, you know, in a sense that it was in our database, you know, five or more years ago. Oh, yes, I'm enough of a fossil that we had, it started as ethnic diversity then it was minority, <laughs> and then it moved back to diversity. It's gone through many different reiterations. I have a question. I, I guess I'm thinking while well, we're kind of stuck on keywordings and stuff in metadata, I guess my question is what's our intention for putting it there, number one, and then is it just so designers can find those images easier? Because in just my thoughts, if that's our intention, just to help designers find it easier, I don't think that that's worth the struggle just to make their job easier. Just my personal thoughts, no offense to designers, but you, you can look through photos and, and, and find the ones you need. And that, that puts a lot on us to be able to put our photos in a spot where they can go through them relatively easily as well. Well, how do you figure out that spot? <laughs> how do you define that spot? How do you find it? How do you, how do you put this since this, in a sense, you're still in a sound, from your words, you're still kind of suggesting that you're going to put these pictures over here. 
No, 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 no. Sorry, I, I, I think I miscommunicated that. Not that those images would, I'm going to put a folder of diverse images somewhere. I don't mean that. I just mean in general, for example, like our stock photo galleries, um, just having all of our stock photos organized in a great spot where, you know, designers can find them or if they have access to our server on the back end, just helping them know, okay, this is our filing process. And these were these, this is where these images would live um mixed with everything else that we photograph yeah i think one thing we're not uh, addressing that <clears throat> probably eight nine years ago i stopped doing um was people wanted i was asked to put male and female on images and i'm like mm, we can't do that i mean that you know aside from people you know in uh, be it trans, transgendered or whatever. The issue is, do I know? Or can I miss it? Boy, that's that's like asking somebody if they're pregnant. I mean, if you misidentify, I mean, it's, it's, it's a pitfall that is like, I think Nate just said, it's not worth it. You know, if you go through and you, the photo should stand on its own, not as if it's a, you know, a male or a female or a diff, different ethnicity, so. Right, at least with male and female, nine years ago, you had a higher chance of being presumptively accurate than you do with, with certainly racial and, and community diversity terms. I, I was just gonna read the one sentence from our, our, our user update about our change in diversity, which was while we initially created uh, the diversity theme and tag to aid users, uh, frequently searching for a variety of image reliance on the word diversity is too often become a form of othering that risks tokenizing people of color and other represented, underrepresented members of our community. And that's where our, you know, our intent was in the right place at one time in aiding people, but the result has been othering certain groups of individuals while not tagging everyone equally. And that from a keyword perspective is very different than I think tagging an image as being science versus student life versus, um, you know, campus buildings. But even like for a lot of our campus walkway scenes, and because we're an urban university, I will identify people as pedestrians, not as students, because I don't know if I made a shot, you know, a long lens shot of a group of people walking by. Um, it's, you know, I have no assurance of knowing what, you know, what it was. Um, so there's, there's just a lot of other forms of sort of um, putting people in certain buckets that um, may not always belong in those buckets or want to be identified as being in that bucket. I'm going to jump in about um, looking at some of the questions in the in the chat, Chris. I don't know if your question is rhetorical, but I'm gonna um, put you on the spot and make it a learning moment, and maybe moving forward, think about a different word than master. Just something to think about when you're using everyday conversation because of the historic use of that word, but. Um, do you want to elaborate on, on your thought on your comment? Do you, yeah. Was I, it just I rhetorical can. that it's frustrating to think about having to accommodate multiple departments? Yeah, I can. I can. Um, thank you for uh, calling me out on using that term. That's uh, not lost on me. And it was a slip. Um, but it, but it yeah, is a I, quote from the, from the Bible. I mean, it's not. A, a little bit. It's yeah. a racist. <laughs> it's a racist term. It's a racist but word. Yeah. The, it, 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 Levi's not wrong, but neither are you. And, and I shouldn't have used it and I don't want to, and I didn't mean to, but anyway, um, yeah, I was struck just by the conversation of like, we have, a, we have a responsibility to serve our subjects appropriately. And maybe serve isn't even the word of this, but like, we want, we want to represent the image appropriately by keywording them appropriately. Mm -hmm. um, we don't want to other people by keywording it inappropriately. 
we also don't want to over keyword. We don't want to under keyword. We want to make the rest of our team's job easy, but not too easy. <laughs> I just was struck by the fact that sometimes this and a lot, a lot of parts of our jobs can feel like rock and hard place. Um, sometimes lose, lose. Um, I don't know that I really, well, I don't know what I was going to say really there, but um, yeah, I don't know. It just kind of struck me like we got to do one thing to do our job right, but mm -hmm. sometimes it feels like we got to do something else and they're not mutually exclusive, but they also don't always work together. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really know how much I had to say about it, but I was inspired to post in the chat. Yep. <laughs> I so, think it's important to realize that this this is going to take a lot of time. You know, a lot of these dynamics, like I said, are, are institutionalized in in our core structures, and it, it just takes time to shift that. Um, you know, to kind of came up earlier about what, what would be a student's perspective. And while I'm not a student, I've had conversations with students, you know, and, and some who have battled the diversity of our campus. And you know, really, it's that that challenge of you know okay, we want to show diversity, but then if we show diversity, then they're being used and they don't like that either. And so it's like, what are the students wanting? And so the conversations I've had is that, you know, students are wanting to be seen, they're not wanting to be used. So I think it's really important in how we go about capturing diversity across our campuses is that, you know, we, we are open to capturing them and showing them but we're not using that. We're not just, oh, that's a you know black person. I'm going to photograph them. Oh, there's an Asian there. I'm going to take a picture of them. It's, you know, what are our students doing? We're thinking about, you know, oh, this is a class of students and we're looking for diversity in that, but we're not using them by tagging them, you know, Asian American or African Americans so that, you know, somebody can pull that as a token use of that individual just because of their race or what, are they, what they identify with. So, and, and I get that it is very hard to balance that. And we don't always have control of how they're used. Um, but I think it's important for us to really focus on, you know, we're not trying to use students as diversity. We're just trying to show them in a diverse group so that we keep our students understood that they're seen across campus and represented, but they're not used in a way that exploits you know, their own identity. Yeah, it's when I I'd say it's a great point, Jason. And I know we're getting, we're, we're really getting bogged down here in uh, <clears throat> metadata. I want to throw an idea out there um, and not necessarily for discussion, but just a thought um, I've had with other uh, people uh, around the, the issue of dam. Think back to a library 120 years ago in words they use to describe things that would be anathema to us now, but they are historical words that help find things in a library. How, think about what do we, do we need to hold to that or are, are we constantly evolving and getting away from that? You know, just a, a thought that, or do we keep those historical words to find things still? thought. Again, not a discussion point. I don't want to get bogged down in that, but something to think about. What's the Library of Congress do? Because um, they're not scrubbing their database of things. Um, so we, I want to kind of break away from uh, keywording in that and talk about <clears throat> another part of what we're doing. Um, you know, Jason touched on this, authenticity. How do we photograph that? How do we make sure we're doing that correctly? One thing, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Jessica. So, so one thing I've been struggling with lately is I've been posting a lot to our Chico State Instagram. Once a week, I've been doing student profiles. And I've been getting um, a lot of feedback from our university communications department asking for diversity. And as much as I think it's very important to show all of our students throughout our campus, we really aren't that diverse. We have 2% of our student population being Black. And so um, one problem I've been having is I don't want to misrepresent our student population on our social media and have potential students looking at Chico State thinking, wow, like 
this university is so diverse and they come here and they realize most people don't look like them here. So that's just, just one kind of struggle I've been having where I want to represent everybody, but I also don't want to misrepresent the population of our campus. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in on that. I yeah, I think that's something that a lot of us um, struggle with, and it was literally something we were just talking about before the meeting started. The concept of where is the line between your work being aspirational and showing what the university really hopes for its future and being authentic. And in my mind, um, the line is slightly above reality. So as I said before the meeting started, we're seven percent. African American at BU. So I'm specifically speaking about African American, not neurodiverse, and I and and all the other ways in which a person can be different. It's the wrong term to use, but um, and in my mind, it 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 feels like if you're seven percent, like maybe ten percent of the work you produce should reflect that. That I feel like it's very very close to not push too much and not be um, um, uh, unrealistic. That's what I think. So if, if, if I was, if I were you, I would sit down and do the math and in my mind and figure out, okay, every 10th student should possibly look different in this way or, or whatever, but that's just me personally. Does anybody else have thoughts on that? Yeah, I'd like to chime in there as well. Um, just because I know my office, which is university communications has a very high profile for the library and we manage very high profile institutional, um, social media accounts, and uh, both have been subjects of some rather uh, revealing and critical um, case studies, particularly some classroom case studies in a couple courses that are really looking at uh, diversity and representation, um, where our social media account was also called out for having an extremely disproportionate uh, representation of uh, people of color in um, our main UW Madison uh, Instagram account um, in the number of images posted showing people of color relative to the population numbers on campus and our student population in particular. Um, so Jessica, I think you're, you're right to um, be aware of the topic and proceed cautiously. And it's, there are important lessons to hear and learn and consider as you move forward. Everyone's being quiet now because I'm trying to read some of these questions and comments, which are always really good. So talk amongst yourselves. Coffee. Can I, can I ask a question that kind of, kind of steers it a little bit? Um, Jason said something earlier about students wanting to be seen and not used. And I really, really resonate with that. And we've had students, uh, we've had that, that story, exact story with some of our students. And it's, it's one thing to build a relationship with the students that we photograph and use in videos and have them understand that it's more about their story uh, that we're trying to, uh, to tell. Um, it's quite another thing for the end use of these images, um, the brochures that go out, um, the Instagram posts without, without writing huge long captions that explain everything. Um, how, how does everybody manage that? Like, for the, for the student that's the subject, we can make them feel known and seen um, on the, the front end. How do you differentiate or what, what do you do between the pre-production and the post-production and the final product to make sure that they're not being used at the end and still seem like they feel like they were in the beginning? Did that make any sense? Because a lot control is out of your hands after you make make that video or image. It is. And I would say, um, you know, I partner with a lot of oh. different departments that are not just in our university communications office, which is kind of the top level communication. I don't have control over our top level. You know, I just 
provide for them, try to have them work. But a lot of that top level, which a lot of us work with, really are the ones that are like forcing diversity out there because it's, you know, directive from the chancellor or whatever, you know, it's like this big, big effort. But a lot of the relationships that I get built are with the departments themselves. So the photographs I take, I'm taking them for them so that their representation is in their departments that they're a part of. So I kind of not worry about the control I don't have. And I worry about the relationships that I can build. So when I work with these departments, you know, I ensure that they have what they want, you know, that they're being supported, that if I go in and photograph, you know, our cultural diversity center, I'm, I, I'm not taking photos that are going to be for anything other than just them, you know, so that they have a group of images that they can use for their department, for their needs, um, and it, they don't feel like they've been used. Um, another thing, too, is also letting students uh, and a diverse group of students take ownership of their own image. And we do that by different kind of um, ambassadorships where you know, they'll have Instagram takeovers we used to do for a little bit, where then it's them. We have no say in what they show, what they share, but it's it's their representation being given to the campus and it's their voice being heard. And and we just, you know, obviously within certain standards of just professionalism, let it let it go. One thing that was pointed out in the paper and uh, David just mentioned this, showing diversity amongst your faculty and staff uh, is really key. Um, because <clears throat> I think, I'm, I don't know if it's Sydney or Susan pointed out, but noting that students and others see themselves aspiring to those positions, uh, you know, valued faculty and staff people. So having a diverse faculty and staff is just as important as a diverse uh, student body. And it's incumbent on us to show that as well. All right, other questions, concerns, things? What can we do better? What can the group do better? You know, I'm, I'm interested, I'm going to I just said a message to one of our admissions people. I'm like, I, I struggle, I struggle with this a lot because when I walk around campus, I see a lot of different kinds of people here. Um, when I walk around town, I don't, you know, like this is a, a very small town in Northern Utah and there are not a lot of, there's not a lot of diversity overall, but on our campus, I see a lot, but I also don't think that our, um, our marketing materials that that we set up to to shoot for necessarily represent our diversity in the right way, and um, and so I'm I'm setting up a, mission, a meeting to talk with our admissions guys to see team to see what like like to better understand what they look for in it in um, ambassadors. We have a lot of student ambassadors, and I'd like to understand how those people are are invited to be ambassadors. You know, are they invited because they're good looking because they're, you know, I suspect it's mostly because they're outgoing and that like, I suspect that's a, a requirement, but you know, are we using, are we using, are we setting ourselves up to start wrong is, is what I'm, is what I'm wondering. Do you know what I mean? I don't know if that's very clear, but, um, but I'd like to see where the source of, of my pictures is going. Cause largely I can call upon ambassadors at any time to come be in a shoot about wearing masks in science laboratories and and i can get those people very quickly and i can't necessarily get a, a, a genuine representation of campus to come be in those photos this week you know what i mean and i, I suspect and, and we'll have that kind of trouble say, yeah definitely and what we used to do a lot of that and it, i always apologize when i called and was asking for different types of students to be involved in a photo shoot and this goes back 20 years ago to now where we just show up at and we photograph who's there. Um, that's under the authenticity um, umbrella. We're not gonna bring certain people in in order to engineer a situation. It's who's there. 
How, how do you mean who's there? Like you, you go to a class and you photograph yeah. who's there. Okay, yep, but like, there. yeah. And if there's, but that's that's not necessarily usable as a marketing piece, right? Um, I, have, I have to get like all of those people have to send a release to be in a in a marketing right. image and stuff. Yeah, I would so, say seven years ago, that's how we did things. New boss mm -hmm. came in, and we're like, nope, whoever's in the class. If I go to a nursing class and it's all female, that's who we photographed that day for marketing in that class. If we go to a class and there's three male nurses, woo -hoo, that's who gets photographed that day. Right. It's or and it goes the other way. There are female auto mechanics. Are there, you know, female fire um, engineers? I mean, it's it's what is there is what we photograph, and then we make decisions after that. But putting people in situations, we've sworn it off. And I feel better about it because the students knew it. Like, oh, that's why I'm here. You know, it's, like, it's really. Well, it sounds like you get summers off then. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, like, what do I do in summertime when I'm setting yeah. up the, the science lab shoot that's gonna yeah. be used for the next, yeah. And it, yeah, it's just who's there. And sometimes it's great, sometimes, it's not, and then the students are chosen because of not who they are or not what they are, but because of you know what they're doing in the classroom. It's not, anyway, it, it's worked well for us. Can I ask a follow-up question to that? Sure. Um, we, uh, we do a lot of, well, maybe not a lot, but we do bigger pieces that are photographed specifically for outdoor advertising, like billboards or buses. Um, there are productions and we we cast for them. And we cast in so much as we reach out to the department and we say, we're gonna do a piece for your department. Um, this is the concept we would like. Uh, we always start with like, we would like your uh, uh, reference for like your great students. That's the first place we like, who do you recommend to represent the department? Um, and then we go from there. Sometimes we only get one, sometimes we actually get to choose. Um, and, I, and I think like maybe part of Levi's question is when we're doing these bigger marketing pieces and we actually have more control over stuff like that, what does that look like? Because Glenn, I, I get that too. Like I go to a classroom, I can't, I can't control the classroom. I'm gonna photograph who's there. And if it's all girls in the nursing class, then it's all girls in the nursing class. Um, it is what it is. Um, but when we're doing the other part of our job, what does that look like? How do people handle that? Um, if you have three people and you have about 30% uh, black students in your school, do you have to make sure that one of them is black? You know, <laughs> it's, it, it, these are all parts of things that we think about, right? And yeah, and I'm not trying to I'm not trying to make you answer no. any questions, Glenn. I'm just kind of saying like I think that might be part of what Levi is saying, and I don't I don't know. It's and maybe maybe so I'm just outside of Chicago, southwest suburbs, um, and parts of our district touch Chicago uh, just a bit. So we're in a like Susan mentioned in the video, we're a pretty diverse um, area, and to be honest, our um, we're probably more. Uh, Arabian, Middle Eastern, uh, than some other groups, uh, just who we are. And what we found is there's great diversity almost everywhere. Um, it, it's, it occurs naturally. Now that's come about in the last, you know, seven years, you know, eight years or so. Before that, man, this was, this was really white. And it was, it was a, it was a struggle, but over time, uh, integration, divert, however, whatever term you want to use has really happened. And students are, are, are just there. It's, it's actually wonderful. Like, I'm trying to think, I went to this engineering class last week and there were, of the eight students in the room, seven students in the room, I think three or four were female, two or three were Middle Eastern and it was naturally diverse. I mean, it was on gender, on ethnicity. And um, then we interviewed, I think, four different students for part of this project. And it was wonderful diversity 
even in those four students. And it was, they were chosen because like you said, the professor picked the top four students to talk about it. And it was great. I mean, I feel like I'm, it's almost Nirvana. I'm, this is, you know, we're getting wonderful diversity and it's, it's genuine. There is nobody picking out, oh, we already have this group. We need a different group. It's just who we get. And we're being honest about it. And that's what I like. So, I mean, that's how we approach even marketing stuff. Who do we get? That's who we'll show. What do you mean? What do you mean? Who do you get when you're, when you're doing the marketing stuff? Like, we just, we're like, we're coming, we're coming to the engineering class and we'd like to interview a few students hmm. and whoever the professor gives us as, as their top students, you know, that that's great. Or uh, if we say we're going to feature the top athletes for the marketing for the, the entire year, mm -hmm. whoever they send us, we're not asking for any particular group. Mm -hmm. We just, who do we get? That's the best student for this marketing piece. Right. I mean, I've got stuff like the cover of the view book, the brochure that goes out to high school students. It's not, it's not a happenstance thing. We set up, we set up a picture for it. Is, is that, do, See, do you we, guys make that kind of thing as well? Or up till seven years ago, we did. Now the cover of the view book is a more photojournalistic photo that we shoot now. And then go I'm, get a model release for it from everybody in the picture. Right. Exactly. See, and we're on an edge now with that as well. Yeah. It, it, and yeah, you know what? Every discussion in photography comes mm -hmm. back to model releases. Um, and I'm That's about true. ready to, you know, if I weren't on campus, I'd find a gun in my house and finish it off. We don't talk so, about guns here. We don't talk about guns. Right. Oh, God, stop, right. Sydney. But it's just, it's maddening because yeah. it, it's difficult. It's an incredibly difficult subject. I mean, verbal consent is enough. Now, that yeah. won't keep you from getting sued, but I mean, just be honest with that's you. That's what we well, do. That's what sure. we do with BU. It's 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 verbal consent as well. And yeah. I and I don't want to change. How long are we here, by the way? As long as we need to be. Okay, cool. Um, I didn't want to like cut off the conversation, but I felt like this would be a good. Uh, I feel like this would be a good Facebook discussion because people can weigh in maybe on like how their university does it. And I don't know. Is that helpful at all? I don't know. Because I, I don't know if anybody wants to speak up to how they handle the releases, but it's it's like st we're straying a little bit. Yeah, not not just the releases, but but the cover the, the cover, get, the cover getting topic people, matter. And, yeah, mm -hmm. like getting getting people to to be in a marketing specific photograph. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that well, I've got thirty campuses I cover, and there's not always something going on <laughs> at any of them. Weird you know, how but, that happens, right? <laughs> So Levi, once I, I photographed, a, we engineered a cover of a something brochure. And it was, this was probably 20 years ago. It had every possible person, everything in it. This, this, this story goes down in history as an absolute nightmare. It was perfect. The lighting was great. The, the clock tower, the, everything was perfect. I mean, international students who were told to wear you know, garb from the, where they came from. I mean, it was like, this thing was, you know, back, if you remember the United Colors of Benetton, it was geniusly perfect. I kid you not, a guy in a wheelchair rolls by this shot as I've got the tripod set up. I think the clouds opened up and beams of light are streaming in. I'm like, I have got everything I've ever wanted. This was the mission of what I was sent to do. I'm like, I asked the guy, will you be in the photo? Sure, sure, sure. So he gets in the photo. It's beautiful. It's magnificent. It gets published. And then an in-service, this major annual report comes, that's what it was, annual report comes out. And the police chief comes up to me and my boss and opens the, the book up to that photo and said, kid you not, as a quote, what is Deals on Wheels doing in the annual report? He's like, this guy is dealing drugs on our campus. I'm like, what? I I'm like, oh my goodness. So engineering this photograph got us in more trouble than anything. 
if we had just photographed stuff on campus. Unbelievable, mm -hmm. which touched off an incredible series of events, you, another discussion. But so we've taken, you know, back to this, Levi, we're like, we're going to photograph our students as they are on campus and our faculty. We're not going to arrange things. Black. Just how it is. Glenn, did you get any, did you get any uh, bonus pay from Deals on Wheels? <laughs> I scored some really good weed. <laughs> I'm going to jump in and um, start calling on the hands that are raised. Amanda yeah. and then Kristen. Not to be a, you know, bossy pants, but. <laughs> Thanks for being a bossy pants. Um, no, I had said in the chat earlier, just um, if anyone has any thoughts or suggestions on things we need to address, um, there will be a version two at some point, I think, or some additions to the paper. Um, even before we started this earlier today, we were on here talking about how we have already had some feedback about things like um, underrepresenting people with different hair color or um, just different looks or you know body image things and stuff like that. So those are some things that we didn't address in the in the paper that um, we've heard from several people now that um, should be part of it. So if anyone has any thoughts or suggestions, please please let us know. Yeah, throw them in the chat too, because we can save this chat and we can keep it for to, to reference back to it. One of the nicest things about being able to, to talk about this paper is that it is bringing up, when we were writing the paper, I don't know about the rest of the authors, but I was super paranoid. We were forgetting something. We were being a white person with white privilege. You don't think of all the things that you're missing. You just don't know. That's part of learning about your privilege is that you don't know all the crap you don't know. So we were very nervous about that. So the really nice thing is about these discussions is that it is it is making us think of little aspects that need that need to be updated in the paper. So thank you for everybody for participating in the conversation. Um, Kristen. Thanks, Sydney. Um, I really just want to thank you all for working on this document, everyone that was involved and um, everyone that supported because uh, right now we're in a tricky situation at the museum and I'm gonna just share kind of this experience that I'm having and, and this document is really gonna help provide some talking points to create some best practices at the museum moving forward. But um, not only do we have students, we're a, a museum, a natural history museum on a, camp, a college campus, the University of Florida. So we have students and we have faculty and research and collections, but we also are public facing. And so the fossil halls behind me. So we've got the general public coming into our museum and we have rotating exhibits. And um, anytime those new exhibits come in, they want our marketing team, when I say they, our marketing team wants photos of people in the exhibits. And of course they want to show everyone that comes to the exhibits. And um, we're really struggling in COVID right now because um, there are a lot of restrictions within the museum, You know, six feet apart, everyone has to wear masks. The general public is um, give, giving a little bit of pushback here and there, and they're not necessarily distancing in, in the exhibits. So we used to have these big exhibit opening celebrations where we would go in and photograph the community enjoying these exhibits, and it was great. We'd get a ton of great marketing photos. Um, but now we're, we're having to pivot to staging photo shoots because the general public is not adhering to these requirements that we have um, in the exhibits. And so we're put in an awkward situation where we're being asked to find people to be in these photo shoots and to show diversity. And it's really awkward and, um, and it's really challenging. And so, especially when we haven't really built a relationship with our community to have you know, models, if you will. So we're asking our staff members and our, you know, that, that might show diversity in one way or another. And it's, um, it's just a challenge and how to have that conversation and to really create those authentic images when we're having to stage these photo shoots um, is just, I just wanted to share that experience and, and this has been really helpful and I really appreciate it. As Matt pointed out at the beginning of the, in the video, we really want this paper to serve as, and I, what I'm hearing is, take it back to your campus, start the conversation there. Um, that's where, we need to move this in the right direction uh, and to have our perspective as the image creators and how we do that. So keep doing that. 
use that, use the paper to help you. All right, anybody else got something you want to contribute? Yeah, I have one more topic I just wanted to contribute. Um, in the past, in, in normal times, uh, we have one of the top te uh, 10, 10 uh, universities for international students. Um, so one of the continual asks we would get uh, is for, we need pictures of international students for specific brochures. And the way we found to successfully uh, deal with that instead of uh, making an assumption that um, this person is international just because they are non-white or um, you think that they're from another country or you don't know where this person's born, we would actually start to do shoots uh, where we would actually um, work with the Office uh, of International Education and we would um, actually photograph, specifically photograph groups of international students and label them as international students. And it was a, a somewhat easy and you know direct solution to a common problem that we had. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. That's a good point. Yeah, there's a way to there's a way to do this correctly, and I think we we're we're all fumbling to find that exact way. But that's a good point, Doug. And good to see you, Doug. By the way, it's been a while. Uh, yeah, we need to have a symposium very soon. That would be uh, nice. An in-person one. Wow, because I miss all you guys, and I mean that in a non-gender way. Please, <laughs> all my photo friends I should say that. All right, so I would say, um, oh, hold on, I got it. Th thank you, Serge. Yeah, definitely we'll save the, we're gonna save our the chat here so we can address things, but reach out to, you know, Sydney, uh, myself, Amanda, uh, Matt or Susan uh, for other things uh, that we wanna look at um, in version or the, the updated version of the paper uh, that we will continue to uh, work on. Um, but uh, I want to thank uh, BYU for uh, hosting us. Uh, thanks, Nate, and um, for everybody for participating. Um, it's good to hear different perspectives. You know, we think we under we get it, and now there's something else that we miss. So thank you all very much, and keep the discussion going. I have one closing comment I just wanted to share because it would not be a, a, a BYU hosted piece if Holden didn't photobomb. Holden, do you want to say hi to your friend? <laughs> Hello, guys. <laughs> he needs more BYU swag. Good to hey, see you, Holden. I do need more. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Keep in touch, everybody. Have a great week, everybody.